Okay, let's let's get going. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody who's in the audience and, and especially welcome to everybody who is going to be doing the talking shortly. Um, it, uh, it's fantastic to have a panel of, uh, of seven speakers who have got, uh, who've taken up the challenge of putting the things that really enthuse them, that make them really proud to shout out about what they're doing, uh, to squeeze that into five minutes. And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute and about the, the programme itself. I'll just do a, a quick introduction uh, to, uh, oops, to Waran, Women in OR and Analytics Network. Uh, many of you, I think, will be uh, long-term supporters of Waran and you will know that uh, we've been going for a few years with the aim of supporting uh, women in OR and reducing barriers. Oops. Um, we run regular events with the, the intention is that we share, we learn, we uh, meet each other, build our own networks and enjoy, enjoy the company. Uh, we have coming up a physical meeting, the first physical uh, meeting for Women in OR and Analytics Network since 2019. We're very excited about it. It's being held at the IET, which is in Savoy Place by the Thames in London, and it is uh, featuring a number of women who were at the coal board. Uh, many of you will know that the coal board was one of the biggest uh, early groups of operational researchers. Uh, and many of the leaders in the coal board went on uh, to become very prominent in the OR community. The women who worked there have been less prominent, even though many of them have had very distinguished careers, and we will be having some of them on a panel to meet. We will also be um, uh, having plenty of time for tea and coffee and chatting to each other. So it's a fantastic opportunity, and we do hope that plenty of people will come along. Uh, if you want to do this, we'll, I'll put a, a link in the chat later, or maybe Karen will be able to put the link in the chat. Uh, and uh, it's probably worth booking early to make sure that you've you've got a space. Um, and then later on in the year, we're taking a break in the summer, and then we'll be at OR65 with a panel session on propellers and barriers, uh, comparing experiences. And that will be a mixed uh, male and female panel. And then on the 10th of October, on Ada Lovelace Day, we have the Land Lecture, which will be online, but it's our flagship event uh, starring uh, Sue Ferns, who is currently uh, a, uh, I've forgotten her exact title, at the Prospect Union, which is a union for scientific staff. So that's what we've got coming up. Um, today's session, we have uh, seven speakers, as I've said. Now, it is not an easy thing uh, to do a five minute talk. It's much, much harder than doing a 10 minute talk or a 20 minute talk. So I'm really grateful to all seven of our, of our speakers for agreeing to take this on. Um, and uh, basically I, I will invite them to speak and they have five minutes. And at the end of five minutes, basically, if they're still going, I will stop them. Um, so uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, but hopefully it's also very enjoyable because the, the idea here is that we all get a picture of what's going on in the lives of other women who are working in our field and uh, what it is that, that really enthralls them. And it's, it's something that if you're, if you're speaking, it's quite fun to do. Uh, if you're listening, I hope you'll, uh, you'll just get a real sense of the variety of different things that are out there. Uh, and if you want to put in any thoughts into the chat, that's great. Um, we did suggest in the, uh, on, in the online advertising for this that there would be breaks, breakout groups, but actually there's not going to be time for breakout groups. We will simply um, allow uh, any questions. There should be time for uh, one or two questions in between uh, in between talks, if anybody wants to ask any questions, and afterwards, uh, if you want to ask any questions. And we're not too big a group that uh, it's too difficult to, um, to to speak up uh, and ask questions. So do do please um, feel free. It is not easy being an, in the audience for these talks either, I have to say. It's quite an intense experience having seven different 
very different areas of work, um, very different styles of speakers. You in the audience have to concentrate. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And I'm really looking forward to it. But please do, um, please do gird your loins. And I'd like to welcome uh, our first speaker. I think this is where I have to stop sharing um, and uh, welcome our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Maria Batara. So Maria uh, is at the University of Bath in the School of Management. So if you're going to OR 65 in Bath, you will uh, actually get a chance to meet her in person if you don't already know her. Um, but I'm sure there are plenty of people who do already know, uh, know Maria. Um, she's, uh, she's, auth she's authored a, a number of articles on um, heuristics and exact algorithms for routing and scheduling, and she gets a real kick out of it. And this is uh, Maria. Ready to talk? Here's my uh, here's my timer. Ready to time, uh, Maria. Are you are you ready? Are you comfortable going ahead now? I think I am. Thank you. Ruth. Excellent. Thank then you over to you. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you for being here. And please all come to our sixty five. Uh, we are expecting you in Bath. Uh, I'm going to speak today about this joint project with uh, Professor Erdogan, uh, Gojangji, and Mustafa Ji, and we looked into wildfires. Why? Because their effect uh, is disastrous in many different dimensions. Human life losses, infrastructure, system destruction, but obviously also the economical damage is major. And the numbers are also actually increasing in the UK. If you look at the disastrous wildfires in the UK, it's pretty impressive, 137 in 2019. But also the small events, uh, they accumulate over time and they create quite a huge expense for the government, but also for the environment. If you look at the statistics, their number is supposed to increase by up to 50% toward the end of the century. And we can consider wildfires not just uh, a result of the climate change because of the increased temperature, but actually also a cause of uh, climate change because of the greenhouse, greenhouse emissions that they are producing. So they are an important aspect to consider, an important disaster to consider. How can we support uh, the operations when a wildfire st uh, starts? So we looked at it from an operational research perspective, and we realized from the literature that we can actually model a lot of wildfires. We can model the forest. We can create a, a rasterized grid of the forest, considering flammable, non-flammable streets, uh, and we can create a map of the forest, very detailed. We can model how the fire will spread over time. If we know how the wind uh, is uh, uh, blowing, we can use the models from the literature and see how a fire, for example, starting from this red dot here, this is a fire currently in action, spreads over time and creates areas that are fully burnt, the black ones, and red that are still active. So what is our task as operational researchers? Make the most of our resources. So how do we coordinate the response of different fire resources? In our case, firefighting teams, so the ones that are spreading water to shut the fire, firefighter uh, planes or uh, helicopters, and also fire breaking teams, those that raise the forest so that they create a barrier where the fire cannot proceed farther. And we develop mathematical optimization models to make sure that the coordinated effort of all these resources is such that we are going to minimize the disastrous effects of a wildfire on the forest. I'm not going to go into the details uh, or it will stop me, um, but I show you an example of how this model works. So we model the forest in the Mula province of Turkey. We created first uh, a rasterized map exactly from the GIS image where we have the forest, the flammable and unflammable areas, and areas of more or less interest, like houses versus regular forest. And we started to simulate what will happen if our model is used in a real fire scenario. And you see, time zero, we have our fire that spreads from an area burnt to the active fire areas. And we start deploying our fire engines, helicopters, fire breaking teams. Fire breaking teams, for example, need to operate a very high safety distance because bulldozers are pretty slow. 
And then you can see how the fire spreads over time, but also how we are starting to deploy, for example, our resources in this case in the north and south of the fire. And the fire finds its escape on the east side of the map. And over time, we have time slots of roughly one hour here, the fire keeps on expanding. And you can see, for example, at the south of the image, the gray area is the one that has been raised. So the fire cannot spread anymore over there because the bulldozers have protected that area. And after eight hours, our fire is extinguished. So our mathematical model is able to provide an accurate response action by coordinating all these resources, considering their operational needs. Um, we believe this is very useful because of the need of coordination and uh, making sure that all the resources are used at their best. But it can also be used uh, for assessing the, vulner assessing the vulnerability of different forests, uh, making sure that we acquire and we use the best resources in uh, uh, the right number. So I hope you got a picture of what we did in this project, but if you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure to reach out. Thank you very much. 10 seconds to spare, that's not bad for an <laughs> Italia. That's fantastic. Perfect timing, Maria. Thank you very much. A fantastic start to the to the afternoon as well. So if you want to unmute and applaud, um, please, please do or just send a send send a picture. But but well done. No need. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, if anybody has got any questions, um, I've uh, I haven't if you want to stick your hand up um, or uh, put it in the chat or hold on to it. Uh, Sue. Sorry, I just got to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, I just wondered, uh, you, have you left the local people in Turkey with the model and are they likely to use it to um, optimise um, the um, prevention or the suppression of wildfires? Um, our co-authors in uh, Turkey are certainly in contact with them and they've shown the R manuscript. Are they going to use it? Uh, it's a very difficult question to ask. Uh, I hope so, but they are certainly in touch and they are aware of what we have done. Uh, we also tried to get in touch with uh, Natural Resources Wales uh, and uh, they were very interested with our uh, project. Uh, we are still uh, on the chase of funding really to make sure that we can implement it and make sure that it's adjusted to the needs of the UK forestry. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that brings us on then uh, very nicely to a completely different topic um, from Nishika Bhatia. So if you'd like to start setting yourself up, uh, Nishika. Um, Nishika uh, did her um, PhD at Warwick Business School, uh, but she's now in India at the Jindal School of Banking and Finance, uh, where she works on retail supply chain management, inventory and pricing strategies, multi-channel networks, decision making. She loves to read and she says she enjoys making comics, which I think we might uh, we might discover while we're um, uh, while, we're, while we're watching. Uh, the topic that the uh, it actually, in, in an American accent, in the original title, it was about the wrath of math. Um, but the wrath of mathematics is, is what we have for, for today. So, um, Nishika, are you, are you, I can't actually see you on my screen. Are you ready to go? Oh, yeah, you are. Yes. You, you ready to go? I'll set it going. Okay, I'm audible, right? Excellent. Yeah? Go. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so the, my topic is about debunking the wrath of math. It's, uh, so I'll tell you why I'm talking about this because I teach at a predominantly humanities science university. Um, naturally I got the chance to teach a very quant heavy course to a set of students who had no clue about mathematics. They had no serious backgrounds in mathematics. They came from fields like psychology, accountancy, law and sociology and so on. A lot of them expressed extreme anxiety and uh, you know just just they were just generally afraid of mathematics and the first few classes were a big challenge for me and a big challenge for them as well so I asked them that what is the reason it's so difficult for them they said it's too abstract 
and the major point they came up with is that it's not relatable enough for them so what i'm going to do here is i what i started doing with these students was i started bringing in applications and examples from their own fields um and what i want to share here is is one of the examples which strongly influenced me and my research as well i was teaching optimization to a set of accountancy students who were not from a very you know serious mathematical background and what i did do to teach optimization to them was teach them through a cash flow matching problem a very basic cash flow matching problem where the decision is to you know decide what should be the firm's financial strategy oh. and when i say financial strategy that means how much should the firm invest uh, where should they invest how much loan they should be taking from where the loan must be taken the objective function was to maximize the net worth or that depending on the problems it could be about the profit as well but the major key uh, part they were learning with in this case was to manage the constraints uh, which was that the cash which is flowing inside the organization should be at least greater than or equal to the amount of cash which goes out okay so that you don't default in the in any in any legal perspectives now the accountant students were very comfortable with this problem i think they because it was relatable to their everyday lives um and when i started teaching them i started with a very deterministic linear programming model but because this was something of their interest we progressed to even more difficult stuff uh, where we you know we learned stochastic programming also because they wanted to understand how do you model uncertainty in financial markets and we also talked about dynamic decision making and stuff like that but there was a catch in all of this which happened with me that some of my students were also working professionals and when they went wanted to apply this model in its current form in practice they were not able to and when i asked them that what is the reason that you know all these models are failing in practice they told me about an area which i wasn't aware of that time which is called earnings management now earnings management is um, a sort of an accounting technique which is used to present a positive view of a business or a financial institution um and the way it is done is in very simple words if i must say is that it's it's just it's just you are sort of manipulating your financial statements to show a positive view right now the advantages of doing this is that you can conceal losses so the reputation of the firm stays great your shareholders are happy the share prices are great but the major disadvantage is here that you can misallocate your funds it could lead to fraudulent reporting now my students were very curious about studying this problem through the you know approach of analytics or optimization and i was and i was very determined to help them do that as well so when i did search the literature on it there was not a lot of research there was few research in this area which was very hard for me to explain to a set of postgrads or undergrads um with students of course we built upon the cash flow matching problem uh, we were successfully able to do some form of it uh where the, we decided the cash policy so we were deciding how much to under report or over over report under certain tax law restrictions as well and they were also i also learned a lot more new things which i had no clue about because i come from a very serious supply chain area but my key takeaway or the key reason i'm sharing this with you all is because i yes because uh, even though i'm from a very serious mathematical background doing this exercise sort of helped me read a new research area and i think as phd students we get too attached because i was just fresh out of my phd i was too attached to my uh research area but doing this exercise helped me learn about new areas which not only you know help me apply whatever i've learned to a new setup completely but it also gave me a fresh perspective to my current research and uh so within the stream of 5 minutes i thought this would, this is a key learning which i wanted to share with you and one small achievement because this was the brief which i got yes uh, <laughs> is that the that the enrollments for this current elective has gone up from 16 to 60 this year so that's all i wanted to talk about thank you so much <laughs> thank you thank you very much um uh, nishika and it's it is it's lovely to have that that validation right at the end of of the people presumably word of mouth saying come come to this uh, and that that interplay between what you were doing and 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 the students so that was great and also perfectly on time you and you and me are setting a high bar for the rest to follow <laughs> sorry suji <laughs> um any any uh, quick questions for uh, for nishika before we move on to um, to suji 
May I can ask one? Yeah. Uh, Nishika, I'm very uh, impressed by like the, your approach to this, and I think it's very important to really bring math to like not scary world, and so that we can reach to especially female young uh, you know students at the correct age. So thank you for doing all of this. I'm wondering, do you follow some of this research on active learning, participatory learning? Are you using some of these techniques as well when you are like uh, teaching this? Because I think it would be quite useful. I think I should. I know I have not uh, done that because so this the, this is for my this was like my first course after my PhD. So I'm still uh, but I would like to do that because this is something which was of my uh, of my interest since I was in my undergrad, and I didn't venture into a serious research into this because it certainly involved a lot of humanities sciences which I was not trained to do for. But regarding the comics, also the reason I think it could be relatable to what you're saying is. So uh, there is this there's this comic blog which I run as well, which is called Doctor Isomorphous, where we put up comics and you know explaining just let's say a very complicated mathematical concept through a story like form. We even created this superhero there, which was she was called Miss Optimize. So, <laughs> but do do share. I would love to. I would love to include more of that. So thank you so much. I also like uh, if you accept. Uh may offer myself as potentially a mentor that can find you the correct people in the US because I do have a friend who written Miss Navla like the steepest descent yeah. story that's very popular and like there are some that people would be, that would be absolutely that lovely thank point. you so much thank I'll get in touch with you for sure <laughs> thank you thank you watching watching networking in action the audience yeah. is extra privileged thank you Suchi um, would you like to um, start getting yourself ready? And meantime, I've known Suchi for, for many years uh, when we were both working in, in government uh, and when Suchi was on the board of the, um, the OR Society. Suchi currently works uh, for NHS England on uh, particularly modelling the elective waiting list uh, to support post-pandemic recovery. Uh, she's got PhD in OR and worked, as I said, in government before she moved to the NHS, and she also uh, supervises projects at uh, Leeds University. But this um, this piece of work comes from a while back because I, I know it's something that you're particularly um, particularly satisfying, Suchi. So if you let me know when you're ready to start, and I'll get the um, I'll get the, the <laughs> machine going again. Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks. Okay. Off you so. Go. Today I'm going to talk about something that I found really fascinating, challenging and worthwhile for kind of the impact it made and influencing kind of spending decisions for adult social care. Um, it does go back to 2015. Um, so just setting up the background to kind of the context of the work, what is the spending review? Um, Treasury has a process that um, kind of reviews spending periodically and um, productivity and efficiency assumptions. It uses economy forecasts to kind of estimate what's affordable and then the outcomes can be to reprioritize or increase spending um, through increasing taxes or borrowing. Um, in 2015, deficit reduction was hugely a uh, huge priority of the government, so they weren't really keen to increase spending at all costs. Um, the scope of my work was to look at um, the adult social care uh, state funded elements and project the costs over the medium terms five years. Um, Prior to 2015, funding in this area had been like reduced significantly. Services had changed a lot and were much more aligned to present day need, meaning that the aging population meant that future spending was set to increase anyway. Um, to add to this, in July 2015, in the budget, they announced um, a national living wage policy. And um, because the adult social care sector is a low paid sector, there was going to be significant additional pressures due to this. Um, there were some various estimates on the national living wage, um, uh, how much it was going to cost going forwards, and Treasury were using some top-down estimates at the time, which looked at the whole economy and then attributed costs by sector by overall percentages of the workforce in each sector. Um, so I was able to kind of get more specific sector um, information around the adult social care sector and found that um, the distribution, the blue lines, um, was more positively skewed, and so that meant there were more of the workforce towards the lower end of the pay scales, meaning that the national living wage would have more of an impact than more generally. Um, I also kind of looked at 
getting information about different job roles within the sector. So care workers and senior care workers were um, pivotal in my kind of case for additional funding and that um, by the end of the five years, care worker and senior care worker um, pay differentials weren't being maintained. So they were getting quite close. And in some cases, care worker salaries were leapfrogging the senior care worker salaries. And so um, the taper that had to be used to kind of make sure any kind of pay differential was maintained was larger than what was previously being assumed in all the top down modeling. Um, I think the reason why this piece of work really sticks in my head and will for a long time um, are kind of these facets of it. So importance impacts, so having the costings and making the case and making sure that funding was available for that back then means that the medium and longer term um, it's in a good stable footing for going forward to meeting the cost of national living wage. Um, Working on a new policy, there was a lot of learning. There was a variety of stakeholders to engage with from academics, think tanks to sector representatives. Lots of unknowns, lots of um, kind of wrangling together, triangulating data and kind of coming up with a comprehensive options paper for senior managers to negotiate with um, across government. Um, the geeky side of things also came through from the modeling. So I was able to set up a model that looked at different scenarios, allowed people to play with lots of different assumptions and stood the test of a lot of scrutiny because Treasury were quite upset my, with my initial kind of double the amount that they had expected at the end of the five years. So there was a lot of scrutiny around the modeling to kind of go, actually, is this the case? So lots of different government departments were involved in looking through the calculations and making sure it stood up to their um, high standards of kind of expectations. Um, the other thing I found really fascinating was around the strategy and tactics of spending review processes and the negotiations that take place, the different stages of it, the complex cross-government team that was um, looking into this problem because the Department of Health had the policy, but um, the services were actually being um, delivered by local governments. So there were a lot of different stakeholders and pay and wages were responsibilities of different departments. So there's a complicated governance structure behind it all. And, and the lastly, I think on time as well, hopefully, public debate. So the way they funded the extra costs were through a levy through um, council taxes. And this was done for the very first time. And I think it just raised the awareness of the general public around how much um, adult social care costs and the cost pressures going forwards. And it's there on your council tax bill all the time. So as a reminder as to what we're paying for. Um, and I think overall, it was about everything coming together to make an impact that was really, really quite um, memorable with it. Thank you. I think you're mute. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Sorry, my 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 machine is um, is beeping madly. Bang on time. Yeah, you made the others look 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 a bit casual about their timekeeping. <laughs> there suits you. <laughs> Every time That's... I practice it, around over six minutes. So. <laughs> Believe. Well, it was also really, uh, I, it's really a tribute to uh, your wider qualities, I guess. So congratulations <laughs> on, on doing that. And I'm sure as we all, uh, as those of us who are based in the UK, as we age, um, we will be extra grateful for the, for the work you did or for, for just bringing those, bringing those issues to the fore. So it's a, it's a real lesson there. So thank, thank you. you. Um, are there any quick questions for Suchi before we move on uh, to Georgina? Uh, I can't. I can't see any. Uh, if you want to put something in the chat uh, later or or now, uh, and and then Suchi can can deal with it in the chat. Or if you have, uh, we may have a few moments later on, uh, if if need be. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much, Suchi. That was great. That was really, Thank you. Very impressive. Um, so, uh, I, now, if I can now welcome uh, Georgina Lang. Uh, Georgina works for the Smith Institute, which is a mathematics consultancy. Are you there, Georgina? Yes, you are. Hi. Yes, I am. I'm sharing. That's, that's a relief. Um, uh, and uh, she used to work in R and D, and she's got D Phil in applied maths, um, but uh, working in the Smith Institute gives an opportunity to work, to work on a whole variety of, of different uh, mathematical projects, uh, including transport planning and uh, rail safety, um, 
I mention those because I guess they're not going to be included in this particular talk. Mm -hmm. Thank so, um, yes, yeah, thank you, Ruth, for your introduction. So, yeah, I'm Georgina and I work at Smith Institute and I want to talk today about a project I'm proud of, which is where me and my colleagues have used optimization on a project in the energy sector, um, which for the ultimate aim of contributing to decarbonisation by helping operators of electricity networks to make good decisions about how to manage their networks efficiently. So um, I'll start with a bit of background and I'd say that like probably everyone here I'd say I'm enthusiastic in principle about the environment and reducing my you know playing my part in reducing climate change and I'm sure the technologies on this slides are pretty familiar to all of you as you go about daily lives you see cars that run on electricity rather than petrol um, and ways of generating electricity from wind farms and um, solar panels which are no longer reliant on fossil fuels so there's lots of um, fabulous mostly engineering feats we can see um, but something that's really quite important is that all these technologies are in reality are not going to exist in isolation because they'll be coupled up to each other via the electricity grid. Um, so if we're really going to make the most of these technologies and use them in the most sufficient way, we really need to be bearing in mind that they are um, coupled together and connected. And so it's an example of how we can manage them based on this coupling I want to talk about today. Um, so this may be familiar to anyone who works in energy, but something that's really important about electricity and a bit more difficult than managing something like a water network is you need to have it balanced perfectly at all times, which means that the amount of energy going into your network, electricity going into your network at any moment needs to be almost exactly the same as the amount of ele electricity going out of your network. And so it means for those who run um, electricity networks, they've got a real challenge there because they need to be always looking ahead and ensuring that this balance is going to be met by managing inputs and outputs. And so there's a lot of actions they can take when things go wrong. So if you've got, on one hand, you've got your generation is exceeding your consumption, you could go and you could ask a power station or something to reduce their output. Um, you could do, now there's newer technologies, you could do something like pump electricity into a battery to store it. Um, or you can incentivize customers who maybe have high energy needs, but have flexibility about when they use it to start to use extra energy at the right times. And then the converse is true as well. So if your consumption, as in what's coming out, is exceeding your generation, you can do the opposite. So you could ask generators to increase their output, turn a new one on, start taking your energy out that you've been putting in your batteries. Or um, some of you might have seen some energy companies have been um, having something called saving sessions or something where they're incentivizing customers to use less energy at certain times with um, financial, things, financial commitments. Um, so there's various things that can be done. But if you are the person who's trying to run an electricity grid, it's there'd be a huge amount of information to think about. You'd have forecasts looking ahead in time of what you expect your generation to look like, what you expect your consumption to look like. Um, there's economic factors. You know, if you're making a decision about which generator you should be changing, how can you do that in a way that's most economical to your consumers? Um, and loads of constraints. So the primary constraint that in what goes in needs to come out but also a lot of network constraints so you've got a finite capacity cable between location x location y you could you can't generate too much in one place because you won't be able to move it so a project i'm really proud of is that my colleagues and i designed a um, and built a dispatch algorithm so this is based upon the technique which will be familiar to many of you mixed in it mixed integer linear programming and it's to balance an electricity grid um, I thought about putting some equations up, but I thought that was not a very enjoyable use of five minutes. So just at a very, very high level, um, what this um, optimization algorithm does is it um, presents the most cost-effective way to balance the electricity grid. Um, and it gives advice to a human operator who can take those decisions, take decisions about what to actually do. And so it can factor in the forecast for what's expected to happen um, going into the future. It can take into account all the, all the constraints um, and the costs of the various decisions they, um, they could make. Um, and something I think is quite excitable, exci exciting Sorry about um, where we are at the moment is that the electricity network is going to change a lot in the coming years as we're getting, we'll get more wind farms, we'll get more solar, solar farms. And so we're getting more smaller operators. So more, um, there's going to be more decisions to be made. You know, it's different from in the past when you had a small number of um, big power stations. And so the, as we're getting better and more efficient algorithms to um, do this um, 
do this work, then it means we can start making use of these assets into the future. So I have 10 seconds left and I'm not going to read the slide out to you, but um, in summary, I'll leave it here as we finish. But I think optimization gives us a chance to use technologies that others are generating very efficiently and we can do a lot of good. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and it, it, it's just really clear presentation of some really complex and important work. So, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, is that Shuya? Are, are you, have you got your hand up for a question? Yes, yes. I am. Off you go. Thanks, Georgina. Um, I have a question about your, uh, you mentioned you used mixed integer um, linear programming. So I'm wondering, could you give us a, a, like just a few examples of what decisions you, you, you consider or what decision variables you consider in your problem? Yeah, so um, I suppose decision variables is what output should each of your generators be generating at time points being fixed into the future? Um, so, yeah, those are the, but I guess there's also various hidden, there's um, various sort of hidden variables in there in terms of constraints about needing to manage different things. Um, that's a bad answer, sorry. But, but yeah, so there's, there's constraints in it. Your ultimate objective is to minimize the cost. So you're looking at fluctuating what values these take. Um, you get your coefficients from the data that's coming in about um, the cost of different assets in time. And there's, there's quite a lot of complexity, which would take vast amounts of time to go into. It's quite interesting in terms of curves of cost. So you, know, you don't have really simple linear relationships. It's not the case if you increase output by 10%, you increase cost by 10% or something. Um, but essentially what we're looking to do is say, what output should we ask each generator to produce at this set of turn points going ahead in the future? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Nishika, I'm going to hold off on you for the moment uh, because I my, my faffing about has meant we're now a minute behind time. So I'm going to, if you want to put it in the chat or we might, might have time at the end, depending on how it goes. Uh, Mary, uh, I, are you, are you um, I think you're, yeah, that's right, Mary. Um, so as Mary's getting herself set up, I just say I've known Mary even longer than I've known Suchi. Um, she's currently at the Department of Transport, but before that she was Head of Operational Research at DEFRA, the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and uh, she's also worked at other government departments. And she says she's married with two children uh, and loves reading, uh, which I guess is how the novels got in there. Um, but I seem, hopefully, my, my time has recovered, Mary, so tell me when you're ready to go and I'll set it going. I think I'm ready now. <laughs> Off Fingers you crossed. go then. Off you go. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm Mary McKee. Um, as Ruth said, I'm an operational researcher at the Department for Transport, and I'm a co-founder of the Civil Service Systems Thinking Interest Group. So I'm going to talk about something I'm really proud of, um, what made it happen and what I think it means about work. It's a story about networks and opportunities and a story about how a side interest has um, changed my career and had an impact. So first, though, a short story you probably already know. And my time is not working here, so I'm just setting a little timer on my side here, so apologies. One day, the wind said to the sun, look at that man walking along the road. I can get his cloak off more quickly than you can. We'll see about that, said the sun. I'll let you try first. So the wind tried to make the man take off his cloak. He blew and blew, but the man only pulled his cloak more closely around himself. I give up, said the wind at last. I cannot get his cloak off. Then the sun tried. He shone as hard as he could. The man soon became hot and took off his cloak. We'll come back to this later. So a bit of background. I joined the government OR in 1998 after degrees in maths and computing and a bit of IT teaching. And I've worked in four different departments, doing a range of OR jobs, developing some good networks. I've been at DFT since 2008. I was starting to feel a little bit stale in 2017. And it was this point, I and a couple of colleagues decided to start the Systems Thinking Interest Group. So Katie and Adam in the pictures here, were also in DFT and Katie's uh, on, online as well. And we'd all recently noticed an increasing interest in systems thinking. We were all enthusiastic about it. And we wanted to make sure we were ready. So we decided to start an interest group 
us and just about a dozen others to start with. We had a certain amount of leeway in our jobs and we were able to put a bit of time to this with our manager's support. So this is what we do. We aim to increase our capability to do systems thinking, provide a network to share knowledge and increase awareness of systems thinking. Between us and a lot of other people in the network, we do quite a bit. We do monthly talks, newsletter, and we just link people up. And we do it as an extra to our jobs because we think it's worthwhile. I've enjoyed the opportunity to be creative, not just the stick people here, but in developing and running training sessions that enable others to try something in their own work. I'm also personally learning and I've enjoyed meeting new people. Through these networks and activities, I was asked if we could run um, system thinking sessions at all the induction courses for new senior civil servants, and they help attendees think about their roles as systems leaders. Strangely enough, it wasn't on my objectives for the year, but of course I said yes. Um, what an opportunity to introduce senior leaders to systems thinking and also to the OR profession. And also we had a great opportunity to learn and network ourselves. Um, we're doing one or two a month now. I've got a great team of volunteers from my networks and attendees often come back and ask for follow-up sessions for their teams and I'm really proud of that. So we've increased the profile and use of systems thinking, not alone, but we're part of it. It's given me new skills and helped me have impact and Katie and I are now job sharing a new role centred around systems thinking, which I'm sure wouldn't have happened without STIG. It's been challenging to rein it in when it's an enthusiasm, but changing my role to deliberately include systems thinking has helped. Um, finally, the level of success we've had um, means we've probably got to make some changes. So there's some uh, good challenges ahead. So that's what I'm proud of. Why systems thinking? And why was I talking about the sun and the wind? Well, I do read a lot, I always have, and some of the things have stuck with me. So there's quite a bit in that ESOP, I think, um, something here about kindness, which is what it says in the book. But there's also something about setting the conditions for people to want to help and also unintended consequences. The Anne of Green Gables, I've always remembered this quote as well. And I think I always want to seek clarity, understand people's points of view. And finally, the choice to take another perspective from the Pollyanna, not just finding something to be glad about. That'd be quite irritating. So some of the things I've internalized are not completely inconsistent with the systems approach. So, you challenged me, Ruth, to say what working life is for. Well, I think it's to have a positive impact. And for me, that's through being creative, applying some skills, learning and collaborating. And being creative, unfortunately, doesn't include slide design. Um, and this in itself is enjoyable. It leads to new opportunities and it makes me feel useful. And that in itself continues to have a positive impact. But setting the right conditions is quite important. And there's something about personal values and mindset for me and having the space to do this and um, the permission to do it. Um, and finally, having some friends to achieve it all with. Oh, that's mine. Sorry, I was on mute there while I was saying perfect timing and, and holding up the beeper to, to, to my mic. Um, thank you very much, Mary. That's a really, um, a, a really inspiring way to end, I think, for all of us is, uh, you know, what's, uh, what, what's working life for? And actually, of course, a lot of it is what is the rest of life for as well. So um, there's your guide to life in, in, in one, one handy reference guide. Uh, should anybody need it? Um, it let's just, uh, if, uh, does anybody have a quick question for, uh, actually, if you've got a quick question for Mary, hold on to it uh, because uh, we're running slightly behind and I want to make sure we have space for Shuya and, and Selim. So um, if you could stop sharing, Mary, thank you. And Shuya, if you could let me know uh, yes. when you're ready to start. And I'll just say that uh, Shuya, I invited, I tried to invite people from across uh, different parts of the OR community uh, and Shuya was at Exeter when I invited her. But uh, by the time we've actually come to it, I forgot that academics move and she's in the same university as, as Maria and in fact in the same building, uh, <laughs> but not in the same room. Uh, and she researches logistics and supply chain management and optimization to improve uh, operational efficiency. And here is Shuya talking about high chain. So over to you, Shuya, tell me when you're ready to start. Thank you very much, Ruth. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. I'm Xu Yajun. I um, will brief today a uh, hydrogen supply chain web application uh, developed by me called HiChain. Uh, so instead of a uh, technical briefing, I will use my slides to um, tell the story behind um, why we built HiChain and to inspire you and me um, how we may take the impact of our research to the next level, um, especially as the equality, diversity, and inclusion, the EDI, is very important to our research. So um, this high chain is a free interactive web application uh, with graphical in user interface. The access link is highchain.co.uk. Um, it now shows the screenshot of the web app. Um, it was funded by me and my colleague, Dr. Mi Tian at the University of Exeter. So Hygen is uh, initially positioned as a smart hub to provide um, hydrogen supply chain solutions and knowledge to industry, students, and general public. Uh, we translate our research outcomes to, into this web app and for us to demonstrate the solution prototypes and for any end users to carry out uh, hands-on practices. So during the last summer, we intensively um, developed this web app from scratch for one and a half months uh, with the uh, collaboration with a graduate intern as the web developer. So you can see it as a staged outcome, uh, which is still working in progress. And we, we will move it forward when we manage to get some funding. Uh, so including the name Hai Chen and the logo were all designed by uh, my colleague and myself. So um, please feel free to visit Hai Chen uh, Play and um, provide us with any suggestions. Yeah. So, so far we have launched two uh, modular tools uh, in the high chain. The navigation bar on the left side of the websites can direct you to both tools. So the first tool is an electricity to hydrogen uh, whole chain simulator. So from the hydrogen production to storage and all the way to end use applications. The backend uh, simulation models were developed and coded by uh, in, in MATLAB software by our MSc students as his dissertation project. So uh, it now shows the hydrogen production page. Uh, users can fill out the form um, on, on the, on the uh, left in the input boxes with different like um, variables and then uh, click the compute button and then uh, it will return on the right hand side a result diagram and you can also download it to your local drive. The second tool is called um, Hydrogen Stakeholder Assessment Tool. The backend uh, is a three-phase multi-criterion decision-making method for evaluating and uh, selecting the best hydrogen technique or supplier. So we wrote up the method as a paper now under review um, at the Annals of Operations Research. Uh, only a few um, multi-criterion decision-making methods have been transformed to software with a graphical user interface. So ours is the first of its kind for hydrogen supply chains. So a great deal of uh, innovation was also uh, put into the front-end design. Uh, so this is the screenshot for uh, for you to get a feel. Yeah. So uh, you you can tell that there are three uh, matrix and therefore pairwise comparisons. The CR light on the top left corner would change the colors um, automatically between red, yellow, and green uh, when users like uh, input values. So just like uh, traffic light systems. Uh, so in order to indicate if the matrix has passed the consistency check or whether it um, still needs to uh, revise the, uh, the, the adjust the values in order to pass the consistency check. Yeah. So just to wrap up, uh, overall through the high chain, well, our next step is expect to pitch to industries to customize and use our solutions, um, uh, our solution tools. And also uh, we, we, we can tailor the tool for use at different levels of educational institutions for teaching outreach and further design purposes. Yeah, so that's all for a very brief introduction of this high chain software. Yeah. Thank oh. you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Shua. Um, and again, a, a, another completely different 
application and and really important in the um, in in today's world because of course hydrogen is is one of the um, potential uh, potential um, solutions I guess to um, to to carbon problems uh, so brilliant thank you um, I'm going to go straight on to Celine if that's okay. And then if you do have any questions, uh, do put them in the chat. Thanks very much, Jane, for putting some things in the chat. Do do put questions in the chat uh, or ask them uh, after uh, when we've, um, uh, when we see how much time we have left. Um, but Celine, tell me when you are ready to go. Oh, I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> Sorry, Celine. <laughs> uh, Celine uh, hasn't been in the UK for all of her career, but the, the short time she's been here, she seems to have made a great impression and, and, and met a lot of people. She uh, received her PhD from Cornell University, and she's worked in the USA and Singapore, as well as the UK. Uh, and her re research lies in the intersection of optimization, stats, and decision making under uncertainty, which is quite a big intersection, I would imagine. Um, but this is about work that she's done in uh, Cambodia and uh, and Singapore, it says here, but um, mm -hmm. Cambodia is the point. So, um, Celine, when you're ready. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for an amazing uh, session. I have noticed that a lot of people are, have um, common passions with me, which this story uh, will be all about. So I'm a very passionate individual. I think Ruth can uh, maybe testify that based on our limited interaction. I'm passionate about volunteering, traveling, nature, and uh, wildlife. Sorry, my slides are going. Should they shouldn't. Um, and uh, maths and maths education, literature and poetry, children in general, and mentoring the young generation. So when I came to the uh, UK and I was tasked to uh, supervise a number of dissertation in this gigantic master's program that we have, I decided that I have to bring this passion and do something with it during this dissertation projects so that I do not go mad in some sense. I had to find some uh, joy in what I'm doing. And uh, this is a result, this project is a result of that uh, search to bring the joy into the uh, dissertation projects um, that I've been running. So um, I've been a volunteer um, uh, one way or another all my life. And I went, when I moved to Singapore, I desperately tried to find someone to work with and volunteer in a meaningful way. And I met this beautiful lady, Sue, who is a writer, and she introduced me to Writing True, which is a great uh, NGO that is working in four countries, Cambodia, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, America, and now they're expanding to Mexico. And their whole goal is to find underprivileged youth or marginalized societies in general, and then give them a voice. And they do this by running these workshops, uh, which are five-day workshops, and each uh, workshop uh, has this uh, very structured way on Monday, the uh, volunteers go in and write some poems with the group of students as a group. And then second day, they help them write the individual poems. Third day, they write um, stories. And fourth day, they write the individual stories. And on the fifth day, uh, they help them to present these stories so that they gain some presentation skills, which can be very important in places like Cambodia. So they have a very serious challenge. Uh, they rely on volunteers, um, places like Cambodia, Mexico, uh, they're extremely corrupt. They don't have data in order to show that the donations they get actually has an impact. And this is a serious problem for many of the NGOs in the field, in Africa, in Cambodia, and elsewhere. So we thought that, what can we do? I thought personally, what can I do to help them to collect data and then show that they actually have an impact? But of course, it was not possible to get test scores from Cambodian authorities. It was not possible to do a longitudinal story. And I then noticed I can be creative and I can use the data that is collected by the help of my master's students who have a lot of data skills. Uh, to actually mine what exists. And what exists is this. So every workshop ends up a um, uh, um, booklet of poems written by students. And um, uh, we just need to show somehow these poems are, which are written after the workshops 
had actually some positive impact on these students. They're able to somehow uh, think more creatively. They're more efficient users of English language and etc. So I have done uh, four MS projects uh, looking at this set of poems. The first one was uh, like what already had been collected by the NGO in Com Cambodia in 2021. And we apply some unsupervised learning methods to these poems to try to quantify if uh, the workshops had some effect. And the second one was a um, um, field study that we ran in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, which was funded by WSI Stimulus Funding 8K from University of Southampton. Sorry, I'm really bad compared to others in time. I'm just gonna take one minute. So uh, my students were able to show that, um, first of all, we could give them an Excel tool. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, we gave the uh, NGO an Excel tool that they can actually put the data they collected and use uh, some basic skills to just mine what they have. Then we were able to do a classification project, which we were able to show that in the data, in the first data set, there are actual three clusters. And these clusters correspond to students who are coming from very low um, educational background to medium to high, which gave us the, like, the hint that these workshops are actually working. And then in the second year, we have run this experiment where we actually did field experiments, we divided the students into three groups and we compared their scores and there was a difference. And uh, then we wrote a very nice, I think, um, artificial intelligence paper with it. And this just been published this year. So that is my story. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Celine. Um, squeezing in the extra few seconds. That's, that's, that's great. I didn't tell you, Celine was the only person who took up the opportunity to have her slides advancing automatically, which is even more of a challenge. Um, and it didn't work very well. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but the I thing is, you have challenge. to keep up with them. So thank you all very much. Um, if you do have any questions, I've put a feedback form in the uh, a link to a feedback form in the chat. I'd love you to fill in the feedback form if you've not, whether you've got questions or not, because it's just a real help to the to the speakers and to the organisers to know uh, how well these things are going. Um, if you want to put something in the chat before we close down the meeting, you have about half a minute. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers enormously. I think you all did a fantastic job. It's not, as I said at the start, it's really not easy to compress something into five minutes and to make it meaningful and to convey a message and to let people understand exactly why it is this is worth knowing about. And I think you all did that absolutely fantastically. So I think it's been a great, uh, a great hour. Um, I would like to remind everybody in the room that we have a physical event on the 26th of June. If you are um, not a member of Women in OR and Analytics Network, it'd be really good if you could sign up for it because then you will get the emails. Otherwise, you have to keep checking the OR Society website for details. Uh, but do uh, the, um, the link was in the chat at the start for those who were here at the start, um, and I don't have a moment to, uh, to repost. Uh, but thank you all very much. And perhaps you could unmute and we could just do a final round of applause. I don't quite how well it works for our speakers but thank you all thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you everybody thank you bye everyone thanks thank you. bye everyone bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Hey.